Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child through the method of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. Today, we have our fourth and final episode for our book study on the Good Shepherd and the Child, A Joyful Journey. This has been a really wonderful process for me to dive into this book once again in all of its depth of wisdom that it contains. I really hope that each of you have enjoyed reading this book just as much as I have. On the podcast today, I have Claudia Schmidt with me, and she has a very unique perspective because she lived with Sophia and Gianna in Rome for eight years being trained by them. And she has been a catechist for Catechesis of the Good Shepherd for 33 years. And 32 of those years, she's been a formation leader. Claudia and I had a really great discussion, and it very much chronologically goes through the chapter. So this is one of those episodes that if you own the book, The Good Shepherd and the Child, A Joyful Journey, you might want to have it in your hand as you're listening to this episode, because we walk through the chapter and discuss different parts of it pretty much chronologically. And don't forget to join the discussion on our Facebook page about this chapter. The remaining chapters of this book have a lot more wisdom, so I really encourage everyone to continue reading it. Get your friends together, get fellow catechists together, fellow parents together, your family together to continue and discuss reading this book and all the wisdom about God and the child that is contained within it. I really hope you enjoy this episode about Chapter 4, Sources of Nourishment. Welcome, Claudia, to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. We are very excited to have you with us today. Oh, it's my honor to speak on the podcast today. Claudia, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, if people ask me from where I am, it's quite difficult because I lived in so many countries. But main thing, I was born in Chile and grew up in Colombia. So those are my roots, main roots. And how did you get involved with Catechesis of the Good Shepherd? Well, it was not planned at all. I was living in Brazil and a professor in Germany stopped his car and said to my dad, the Holy Spirit talks to me. There is something about Montessori and something about religious religion in Rome, and your daughter should do that after a Montessori training. Wow. Okay, what is this whatever, Montessori whatever religion? No idea. But I had one week time to decide if I should go or not. (laughs) And my interior said, okay, go. Wow. I didn't know Catechism of the Good Shepherd. I didn't know Sophia nor Jana. But there I went and my history began 1989, the adventure with Sophia. And so I went there and Jana showed me the atria and I thought, "Mm mm-hmm, yes, interesting. I didn't fall in love immediately, but then I fell in love like after months, after months, it got bigger and bigger. And I just wanted to stay like six months in Rome, but then it was eight years. Eight years? Yes. Oh my goodness. With Sophia and Gianna? Yes. With them. Wow. Wow. To sit at the feet of Sophia and Gianna for eight years and work with them, with the children, that is such a gift. Yeah. And it was a lot of fun to be with them. Yeah, I bet. I bet it was. And how beautiful because Sophia is one of the one of the three authors for the chapter that we're going to be talking about today. Sophia and Patricia and Rebecca. And you know all three of those authors, don't you, Claudia? Yes, I do. So today we're going to be talking about chapter four of The Good Shepherd and the Child, A Joyful Journey, Sources of Nourishment. This was a very short chapter, just four pages long, but there were so many things that was written in this chapter that was powerful for me. Um, So many little nuggets of information that they wrote that I I just wanted to highlight over and put, I have lots of stars next to things within this chapter. (laughs) Yeah, me too. (laughs) One of the things is right there at the beginning, it says, or in the second paragraph, it says, first, we know we can never speak adequately about God. When it comes to children, we may feel even more powerless. Sometimes we may want to avoid the subject altogether for fear of making mistakes. However, this is not really a solution and silence itself can be a mistake. This was very powerful for me because 
it really called me out. I know that there have been times in my life where I have been very intimidated about talking about such an, an important subject as God with my children. Being intimidated to the point of silence is even bigger of a mistake. Yeah, I think so too, that we are afraid of the word of God. And what we teach, what Jesus teach, just come to me, right? And I learned from Jana and Sophia that just be yourself. Be a child, God within you, and you will talk the language of the child. And what Jana had were her eyes. Her eyes were so warm, so loving, that that was her language. And the children felt that, and the language of God was spoken. Mm, through her eyes. Yes, her eyes, and also Sophia's eyes. Very tender, very loving. And I think our whole body also speaks, not only our words, but the whole body. And like I said, just just be a child, your inner child, and the child will recognize the voice. And not be silent, not just be so intimidated by the subject matter that we do nothing. Yes. And silence is just not being, it's like, I don't want to talk about God because I'm afraid, but God and Jesus taught us not to be afraid. Mm -hmm. He just calls us to be. I think the other part that can sometimes be very intimidating is the fear that the child will ask a question that we don't know the answer to. Oh, we can be very sincere to say, I don't know. I have to wonder. I have to ponder about it. Maybe we can discover together. Mm -hmm. oh, I like that. We can discover it together. Is there a part of this chapter that really stood out to you, Claudia? Many things. <laughs> <laughs> but let's begin with the question of content, what to say, the Bible in liturgy. And that is the tradition of the church, right? And if you wanted to see Sophia upset when the people say, oh, Jana's method and your method are wonderful. You did such a good invention. She got upset and says, it's not mine. It's from the church and their tradition. Mm. And that's so deep because Sophia and Jana were very humble and saying, no, that's not mine. And later it says also on page 32 that uh, to encounter touch um, in intimacy with Jesus Christ, what method helps us to do this way that avoids us putting ourselves and our experience between God and the child. Mm -hmm. Practically, we don't have to be afraid because it's not my teaching. It is his teaching. And you know, Carrie, it's like when I'm really tired and really tired and I think, okay, I cannot do that anymore. A child comes and says, Miss Claudia, can you mm. do something for me? And I... Of course, you know, <laughs> they know how to make you fall in love. And that's why a part of Sophia, I have to look up. It says, you seduce me, O Lord, and I let myself seduce. And that's so true. The child just knows how to talk with you, how to conquer you, how to make you fall in love. Mm. So that's a tradition of, of the church, which is so deep. And it's our tradition to our life in the church. Then in call to intimacy, in the past thousand of years, much of theological thinking tended toward abstract intellectual. Mm -hmm. And on this, Sophia always um, said, you know, you have to narrate something. Tell me something about it. And also Ratzinger in one of his books says, we forgot how to narrate the, the Bible. Not to have it intellectual, but to live it. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is also very um, important because we are not giving a, a pedagogy, a education of information, but formation. Mm -hmm. And this formation we do together. We're living an experience with the exactly. children. Yes. Yeah. That part that you lifted up right at first from page uh, 32, 
what method helps us to do this in a way that avoids putting ourselves and our experiences between God and the child. That's a, I know for myself as a catechist with children that I have struggled with this desire to just impart my knowledge onto the child or to show how much I know about a subject because of my own wounds or whatever. But this calls out that it's important for us is to sit alongside the child, experience it with the child, not be in between the God and the child exactly. with our own words and knowledge and, and whatnot. Be that experience with them or co-listener with them. Because we are brilliant, right? Our, our ideas <laughs> are perfect and we have to infuse it to the child, right? And then we have to say, oops, nope, go a step back. Yeah, it's like you said, it's not about the intellectual throughout history that we have moved towards, unfortunately. It's more about the experience and the relationship. And then from that, the knowledge comes forth. Yeah, it's like a breathing. You know, you breathe in and out and you take your time to breathe. And, you know, when you go to children must be allowed enough to gaze on science in their deepest dimensions mm -hmm. because science disclosed their endless wealth to them and to us in a gradual unfolding way. This is on page 33, the child's capacity for wonder. But I'll come mm -hmm. back afterwards to, to the theme of wonder. What also is the power of meaning of science and we very very well um, know what St. Augustine said of the sign. You will see one thing, you understand another. Mm -hmm. And that is so important also for the catechesis, for the child. We see the child, but there is something much deeper. Mm -hmm. And if we see that, again, that is the language we use with the child and our fear is going away. Does it make sense? Yes. And it's so beautiful because it is just aligned with our faith as well. We use signs in everything that we do. We have um, the signs of water and fire and candles and motions and, you know, standing and kneeling and all of these signs that we have that have the surface level meaning, but then they're so much deeper. So just like it says in this chapter, we are using this, we are using the method to communicate. Let's see, I think that's on the first page of the chapter. If our choice of method corresponds to the nature of the content we are trying to communicate, we have a vehicle to be compatible with the message. So we're using signs because that's what the method has always used, using a method that's compatible with the message. Yes. And like it says also, choice of method, how to say it, we have a vehicle that is compatible with the message. If mm -hmm. it does not, there is a danger of distorting it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also why um, Sophia studies in parentheses mm -hmm. that we read the Bible with the Bible. And they have an incredible knowledge in their heart to understand the Bible. Of course, they choose the, the themes and the um, the presentation for each age. But I was also very surprised because at the very beginning, not knowing catechesis, and I saw Sophia just taking her Bible and reading from it, and I, they won't understand that. And I was <laughs> surprised how much they did and mm -hmm. how much they do. And so they practically don't need me. And that's the beauty. Like I had a child, three years old, Miss Claudia, can you show me something? Okay, I showed her a presentation. Then she says, now you can go. You know, <laughs> they show you the measurement, how much they want or need. And you have to listen to this inner voice. And that mm -hmm. is also a method, I think, to listen to the inner voice. Yeah, and I agree with what you were saying earlier, that it's such a relief to us as the adult that kind of like the pressure's off. We we don't have to know all the answers because it's the layers of answers that are right there within the signs, within the word of God that we're just presenting and, and not getting ourselves in between it. 
and trusting that the Holy Spirit in us and the child will be able to communicate with those layers of signs already. The pressure's off for us to know all the answers. Yeah, the Holy Spirit has to do his work, right? Mm -hmm. And also when sometimes I go to the atrium and you surely too, you pray to the Holy Spirit, I pray to the Holy Spirit and he has to talk. That's his job, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rebecca said something really beautiful in one of the first episodes that we recorded of the podcast. She talked about how we baptize children at a very young age, usually, and they we believe that they've received the Holy Spirit. So we need to trust that the Holy Spirit does live inside of them and will be communicating with them whenever they encounter God in this way. Um, so who are we to sit there with all the answers when the, they have an even better teacher with, within them, which is the Holy Spirit? Yeah, like, um, the you know, the part that only Jesus is a teacher and mm -hmm. there is a inner master and an exterior master, indirect master. Mm -hmm. And the direct, direct master is Jesus, God, Holy Spirit, and indirects are we, and we have to know our limits. Where do I have my limits to go to the child? And that is just the presentation and Maria Kerygma. But that's it. We cannot go inside. Because Montessori says, then the character is damaged. You know, if we do so much of our own information, we can damage practically um, the personality of the child. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we did that. I did that in in my life where I said, okay, I know better, you know, in the past before knowing this. I have to communicate. I have to say. The child has to understand. And like Montessori says, there are two uh, mortal sins, pride and anger. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to be careful about that because does the child understand or not? you know, anger. Mm -hmm. So also we have to step, uh, take a step back and breathe. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And trust and trust the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yes. I love the part in this chapter where it talks about wonder and the layers, the layers that, that you can encounter when you, when you're living in a state of wonder, the layers of God in the layers of what could be revealed to you when you're living in a state of wonder. And it also called me because within the, within the paragraph where it talks about the child's capacity for wonder, she talks about the need for space in order to encounter that feeling of wonder. She says the climate is the opportunity to be able to stop a while and dwell on reality since wonder is not for those who are superficial or in a hurry, it is the offspring of the contemplative spirit in us. And it made me think about the need to create moments in a child's life and even within our own life that is slow and calm so that you can actually encounter that state of wonder that makes you encounter the deep layers of our spiritual lives. Yeah, with wonder, I will explain a little more, bit more when we go to parables. But like you say, wonder has a, his own structure in not hurrying. And that's something we do. Like we run to the atrium, we go to the children, you know, what about mm -hmm. time? What about breathing? And one of Sophia's um, favorite text is in a book called A Memory for Wonders from Mother Veronica Namoyo mm -hmm. Le Goulart. However, um, this, this woman, before she got a sister in her uh, young age, the parents did, did want to, that she gets to know religion, so they never talk about it. Mm -hmm. And she says, I knew you know, when you are in Africa, you see the sun, the whole horizon. Mm -hmm. And she says, I knew that all this beauty was created. I knew God. 
This was the word that my parents had hidden from me. I had nothing to name him. God, mm. Yu, Allah, or Yahweh, as his name by human, by human lips. But my heart knew that all was from him, and him alone, and that he was such that I could address him and to enter in relationship with him through prayer. I made my first act of adoration. Mm. And so that's one of her favorite texts. Um, Sophia wrote her and asked if she had more experience like a child, uh, like from adoration. She says, no, that was her biggest um, experience for her life. Mm -hmm. So this adoration, they do that. You know, when they work with the material, they have their silence and their uh, contemplation. And like you say, a space to wonder. Mm -hmm. I think that's also we that we guide, you know. Like, let's be the indirect master so they can wonder. And I think if we cannot wonder with a child, something is not right. And I think a person in the, their own spiritual life, if they cannot wonder, my my life is dry. And again, not being in a hurry and slow down. Mm. Yet ch children must be allowed enough time to gaze sign on signs in their deepest dimensions. Mm -hmm. And I think we also have to be very aware that the child has a very deep unfolding way. I think whenever we are allowed the time and the space to wonder is when we have questions come up, pondering questions like that make us think even deeper about scripture or God or a subject that we never would have encountered before. But it takes that time and space of sitting in silence and pondering and wondering and that allows you to spiral deeper and deeper into a subject. They even in this chapter, they quote Plato to say that philosophy has no other origin but wonder. So it's that idea that like, it takes wonder for us to ask the deep, deep questions. Yeah, and it says also wonder brings the awareness. And you know, the first experience I had was with a mustard seed. Mm. And with adults or with children, this, oh, this is so small. How can that be the kingdom of heaven? And so I know, for example, Jacopo. I always say this example from a child I had in Rome in the atrium. And he was wondering about the mustard seed, that it grows. Mm -hmm. So... Next year, I presented the mustard seed again. He says, no, it doesn't work. I say, mm. why? I ate them all and I don't <laughs> grow. So this was his wondering, what is the mustard seed doing in my life? So little experiences which every catechist truly has. Like I said, we have to wonder with a child. And you know, with the parables and wonder, let's just imagine... A little book, which would be the Bible, a big adult and a little child. And the adult tells the child about the Bible. Tells them, tells them, tells them. So who is the center? The adult. Now let's picture another scenario. It's a big book, which would be the Bible. A little child and a little adult looking at it and wonder what the message is. Who is the important person? Us, child and adult. We both are breathing in scripture and liturgy. So that's also an image Sophia did. And like with wonder or parables, that we together are living the word of God. Mm -hmm. And the parables, she really did the difference between parables and definitions. Mm -hmm. And it says so here too that the parable are the two levels are like two rails in a track that guides our meditation. So mm -hmm. we don't really see the horizon. It goes and goes and goes. 
a definition is like a box. We are in the box and we cannot wonder because mm -hmm. I'm caught into something. Mm -hmm. So she does this parables and definitions. Same thing with the scenario I just said. The parable is like a, a big book which we are to meditate and to breathe in. Mm -hmm. And it has layers and layers that can be revealed to us that changes depending on what's going on in our life or who is listening or who's listening beside us or what God is wanting to say to us at those times. It's such a beautiful way that the, the parables that Jesus spoke 200, 2,000 years ago are still being unraveled today because of this beautiful way that he, he talked through through wonder and through parables. I love the way in this chapter, it says to offer children the parables as we would offer them a treasure. And then right above it, it says that, that we have to go slowly, almost as if on tiptoe and with a spirit of reverence as we are offering these parables to children. Yeah, and it also say we will seek and discover its secrets I would say mysteries. And then there is a presentation we don't do anymore uh, like that. And Rebecca reveals that at page 676, where she puts a note, if somebody wants to look that up, because it was very long to give an introduction. And then again, read it and so on. And I remember in my first album pages, I also wrote it like that tell the parable with your own words and mm -hmm. so on and it was like Sophia says after many years no I think it's too much and that shows me the beauty that Sophia and Jana observed the child mm -hmm. they wondered about the child and so yeah I remember the first album pages Sophia corrected those and first I was nervous and now I noticed half of it was missing but it was very profound. And you know what was the profound thing too about Jana and Sophia was they respected my inner child. Mm. They saw my inner child. And that just bonded the relationship between us with Jana and Sophia and Sophia and Jana. That respect that they gave you. Yes. Mm. And I knew that respect it's also for the child. They were very, very humble and they wondered a lot about the children. And I think the whole catechesis of the Good Shepherd shows that dynamic of wonder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it says also in the gift of us, what we just said, we are announcing it is addressed not only to the child, but to us as well. Mm -hmm. I love the very last line of that section where it says, remember to speak only in the measure that we are listening. And that means to use not too many words. Mm -hmm. Like Dante said, your words may be counted. Mm -hmm. And to take example from Gianna in ob observation and listening to the children first. Absolutely, yes. So that we don't put ourselves in between the child and God and, and, the, and the communication that is happening there. Yeah, we have to be humble. Yeah. So many beautiful nuggets in this chapter. Very profound, yes. Mm -hmm. And it also says, um, before God's word, we have to have an attitude, openness, and a spirit of joy, wonder, and gratitude to the presence of a gift that reveals itself to us ever, uh, as ever greater, mm -hmm. this joy. And I think with the children, um, at least I feel a lot of joy. And if I don't have them, I miss them really, really bad. But I think this joy, the children sees, notice and feels it. Because if you don't have joy, what are you communicating? Sadness. Mm -hmm. Is the word of God sadness? No. And it's the joy that attracts people to the relationship. Like if I show that my relationship, if I have joy within my relationship with God, 
people are naturally drawn, children are naturally drawn to others are naturally drawn towards that relationship as well. And the children are so good about in just embodying that joy for this relationship. Well, Claudia, is there anything else that you would like to lift up within this chapter or anything from your time with Sophia and Gianna that you would like to, to tell us about before we finish up today? Yeah, I wanted to say about how humble Sophia and Gianna were. Like, Sophia wrote many books, many articles, many conferences, and people who wanted to interview her, they asked, okay, what, what are you? She says, a catechist. No, no, I mean, what did you study? I'm a catechist. No, no, and I mean your publications. I'm a catechist. <laughs> you know, she never put in front who, what study she has, but just she's somebody wondering about the child, with a child, about God and all people's upstairs, I say. And uh, Jana also, you know, many people came to interview Sophia or Jana just because of their name. It's just cool to know who they are. Mm -hmm. And if Jana knew that a person was not there to learn about the child, she just turned around and went away. <laughs> but if she knew that somebody was there because they want to know the child, she gave everything she had. And so that also show, shows me she knew. She knew who was devoted to the child or not. And so it was beautiful how they worked with their eyes to everybody it shows their great humility in front of the child they knew who was the greatest in the kingdom yes. of heaven hmm. yes and also when a niece or nephew i mean our great niece great nephew uh, came to visit her and she was with them in the atrium she didn't care people could come and go no she was there with the little child just exploring the kingdom of heaven, the mm -hmm. kingdom of God. So that shows how much in love they were for the child. What beautiful examples they are to us. Yeah. And another thing, Carrie, which is important is that the work is experimental. That doesn't mean that we invent new stuff, um, but it also means how do I approach um, the child? What can what is useful for the message for the charisma for the child? Mm -hmm. It's not in a box. It's a parable. Mm -hmm. and that is important that we can discover, mm -hmm. and we just discovered through the child. In the parable of the child itself. Yes. The layers of of beauty and wonder and God that we can encounter through encountering the parable which is the child absolutely yes there is also an article right about the parable and the child mm -hmm. and another thing carrie what i learned is that the catechesis is, is objective this means if i'm in a good mood i will say something in a good mood i will good a mood in a good mood and i go to church to mass if I'm in a bad mood, I don't go. You know, it has to be objective. This is a treasure uh, which the tradition gives us. And we have to be respectful and objective because it's it's the word of God. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, Claudia, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us and sharing your wisdom about this method and about the child. We really appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate also your work you do, Carrie. Thank you all for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed listening to Claudia's wisdom just as much as I did. Let's continue the discussion online on our Facebook page about this chapter. If you have yet to buy the book, check out our show notes. We have a link there for you. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. We want to thank all the contributing members of the association because you are making this podcast possible. If you want to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, 
or to become a member, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for joining us this week. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.